This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast digesting the output of our great auteurs and corporate soul-sucking entertainment factories. Today, we're talking about the films and TV work of David Lynch. I'm Mark Lintonmeyer, and I don't know if what I'm saying now is part of the podcast or part of my real life. I'm Erica Spires, and though you can't see it, there is currently a super close-up of my red lips. And I'm Brian Hurt, and I really thought I was a David Lynch fan, but we'll get to that. And I'm Mike Wilson. I live inside a dream. Welcome, guest Mike. Thank you. We're not having you on here because you're the David Lynch expert or anything. You're just a friend of mine that I was looking for a topic to have on. And you like this. What attracts you about the Lynchy? Well, here's the thing. It was kind of a coincidence because another friend of mine was pushing me to watch all of Twin Peaks again and all that. I didn't realize how little David Lynch I'd seen until three weeks ago. I've been binging since. There was a moment in time in like 1990 when David Lynch was huge. In fact, he probably did too much stuff in the early 90s. But if anyone remembers TV from the 80s, it was really strange to see something this unusual on TV. Apart from maybe Sledgehammer, which was that weird like cop on the edge show. It was just sitcoms. So, I mean, it was a strange thing to see in 1990 that this show got on the air. And that kind of stuck with me as also the year I went off to college, too. So it was like this sort of inflection point in my life. And I guess maybe culturally, too. Although I thought David Lynch sort of killed off the 80s. But then I looked. Days of Thunder came out in 1990. So my impressions might just be wrong and subjective. Erica, you suggested this topic. You pushed it on us, even though he has not released a thing recently. And in fact, we'll never release a film again, apparently. Tell us about your motivations there. I don't know if it's just because I'm a Lynch fan or because he has been in the news a little bit more lately, but he's been doing weather reports during this quarantine. He is active and he... There was a film that Netflix just put out, What Did Jack Do?, with David Lynch talking to a monkey about a murder of a chicken. Even when I don't like some of his films, because, Brian, I'm with you on some of them, I'm just like, wow, this is not very good, I think. Maybe I'm missing something, but it's not my cup of tea. I still find myself off for two to three hours or whatever he wants to put me through, where I at least feel I'm completely in another world. And I feel like that's very appropriate for what we're going through in quarantine right now. Sometimes you just need to get into another land. And sometimes the lands that he creates for you are so much worse than what we're currently going through. And it's like a a hellscape, but like a really interesting one. Of all the dystopias to escape to, I need to pick David Lynch's, right? At a time like this? Right. At least it's beautiful. (laughs) I guess stylistically, when you're saying it's beautiful, there's so many elements you could pick on. But the initial thing that came to me is the consistency across his films of the villains, which I think Tarantino stole from. But, you know, picture Frank in Blue Velvet, Dennis Hopper, just this frothing madman with no morals. Apparently no law can stop him. It's these uh, no country for old men type villains. Or that's even a bad comparison because that villain was like principled in some way. I, I don't know. We could get into that. But it goes through to Baron Harkonnen in Dune, viscerally dis- Disgusting villains. Willem Dafoe in Wild at Heart is like most disgusting part he's probably ever played. Yeah, he seems to love to show that, to show the dirty underbelly, the seedy underbelly of towns and of people. And one thing I always am kind of delighted by is how he imagines that in these rather small towns that he picks as his point of interest, we have these big time mobsters somehow that are operating in these probably villages or even towns or cities, very small cities of around 50,000 people. It just doesn't make sense. And it makes me feel like he's probably very childlike in his approach of what the world, what the actual world is. I don't know if he understands what the actual world is. I think that this might be what he thinks it is. Right. There's this not quite magical realism, but this alternate universe that he's operating in. And I think that lens of grossness is over everything because his protagonists are just as gross. Lula and Sailor are pretty disgusting people, but they are, I guess, shrug the ones we're rooting for and wild at heart. Man, I really have not enjoyed rewatching all the David Lynch in preparation for this podcast. (laughs) It's not like binge watching anything else. It's not like binge watching the first season of House of Cards. Right. Because like it's just this never ending flood of information that still you can't quite figure out what's going on. Are we saying things that happened? Can I say a spoiler? This isn't really a spoiler. It's just a thing that happened. Yes. I still don't know why that creature crawled in that person's mouth in season three of Twin Peaks. I almost forgot that it happened. 
because nothing ever came of it. <laughs> so I, there's a lot of stuff I just don't know what's going on. So I feel like Twin Peaks is a little bit different. I feel like they do have sort of cliffhangers that make you want to binge it. And it makes it a bit more bingeable, even though it is very long and involved. So for me, I would still say I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. I don't know that I'm always a David Lynch fan. But I would point you to, Mike, as well as our listeners, there is an over four-hour commentary from a man who did it like a master's thesis, who produced a video on YouTube called Twin Peaks Actually Explained. No, really, his alias is Twin Perfect. It's actually really fascinating. I watched the entire thing, and I think he did a great job of explaining a lot of that that just doesn't seem to make sense at all. And he goes into Twin Peaks, but he also goes into David Lynch's philosophy, as well as some of his other films, and kind of links them all together. And I don't want to spoil too much of that, but I would anybody who's like fascinated and wants to actually understand why, he does a pretty damn good job of explaining it. I want the four-hour explanation of the 17-minute short, What Did Jack Do?, like, why is this supposed to be enjoyable? <laughs> that one I was cramming at the last minute and I watched that at, I think, 3x speed because I, I have that browser <laughs> plugin that you recommended, Brian, where you can just... And so some of his other short films, like that's his recent work. He has a YouTube channel of short films. And some of these I was clicking up to 6x speed and they were still boring. I didn't get through that many of them. Maybe before we sort of focus on the stylistic things that we don't like, can we give it a case for, I think, Erica, you were saying that Twin Peaks was your jam. For me, it is Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive. And I was surprised on how much I liked Blue Velvet watching it again. I don't recall liking it that much, but all three of those films I thought were pretty damn strong. And I guess the thing for Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway that focused things for me at that last minute, I did watch that first half hour or something of the Twin Peaks Actually Explained video that you recommended, Erica, and Lynch's focus on there should not be closure. Like that what makes entertainment disposable is that it gets all wrapped up in a nice tidy package and then you can forget about it. But when you leave something ambiguous, then you leave the reader thinking about it. You leave people debating about it. And he loves that kind of thing. And so it made it so that it was okay, maybe that it wasn't exactly clear what was going on in Lost Highway, and it makes you want to go read explainers about it. It's not a uh, 30-hour time suck that you just put into Twin Peaks that you want to read. You need (laughs) some sort of satisfaction. It's a mere, you know, two-hour experience, but it, it still made me appreciate it even more. How about you, Mike? Of all the things, I still think Twin Peaks is also my jam. And this time, not just for nostalgia reasons, just because there was one episode in that thing. I think it's episode eight. I actually went back and checked. Of The Return? Yeah, Twin Peaks The Return. Yeah, season three, where again, had that experience. How can I be seeing this on television? Now it's on Showtime, I guess. So it's not exactly broadcast television. But um, that whole sequence that's taking place in a void with the faceless figure and the stream of stuff coming out with Bob and all that. I'm describing a visual not very well, but I was just like, what is going on? Like the the whole episode was like that too. And I just enjoyed watching that. And I probably would have watched that episode independently. But just to get to that point, which is so weird, it almost made going through the first seven episodes like worth following through. And there's a lot of other enjoyable stuff too. Actually, season three is probably my favorite of the Twin Peaks ones because it feels like there's a lot less filler. Season two, I actually skipped a big chunk in the middle. But just get to these points and see these weird-ass things on TV. I didn't understand it, but I liked it. Ryan. All right. I guess this is where I get to air my beefs. David Lynch has this style, right, where he's really off-putting and alienating and things are weird. And I used to totally dig it. And I had such good memories of watching movies like Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart. And boy, rewatching it, I, for whatever reason, it's just not really doing it for me anymore. And I don't know if it's I'm in a different place or the world's in a different place and I'm unfortunately stuck in it. I will say, though, that before I even knew we were doing this, I did rewatch Dune recently and I'm a big science fiction fan. And I think what really does it for me with Dune and the reason I like it so much is that it's still really off-putting and alienating for anyone who doesn't already know the story really well. I guess if you've seen Dune a few times, it makes sense. But Or maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. I wouldn't know. I've read the book multiple times and I revere the book. And I feel like David Lynch kind of told anyone who hadn't to just fuck off. I'm making this for people who... It's the thing he made that I'm sort of in on. I'm in on his joke or I'm in on the thing that he's doing. So I feel a kinship with David Lynch in a way that I just don't with his 
other things. When I was a kid, I had a, a neighbor, like the biggest insult that she could give would be to say that someone, oh, oh, they're just trying to be different. Like that was like the insult, right? And honestly, as I've been rewatching some of this Lynch stuff, I'm thinking, oh man, David Lynch is just trying to be different. So I guess I have become the middle-aged lady I had so little respect for as a youngster. <laughs> do you think he's trying to be different though, Brian? Or do you just think he is different? Oh, he probably is different. I think he is effortlessly being different. I don't think he's a hack. I think he is being true to his aesthetic completely. And it's just not my thing. Now, Mark, you said you had to watch a 17-minute short at triple speed to get through it? They're not all zingers. <laughs> I watched that last night, and I just thought it was self-indulgent nonsense. But I went on to Rotten Tomatoes out of curiosity, and that got a critic score of 92%. All these critics just loved the beauty of the absurdity and the distinctive style. But one guy, his name was Norman Wilner from Now Toronto. He's the only one who gives it a splat. And he writes, it's all very silly. It will be embraced as a puckish masterwork from a beloved cultural figure. And sure, what the hell, why not? Look, I don't know what to tell you. And that could be the review of a lot of his stuff. Well, maybe we should start with Eraserhead. I remember seeing this in a theater, I think in college, not first run, obviously, but like, you know, showing the art films. And I don't know if I liked it, but I definitely stuck with me. It definitely had a strong impression. Watching it again, I knew what to expect. There were some visual elements I appreciated, some tonal elements I appreciated. It was mostly kind of watching it to see how it fit in with the rest of his output, but did not actually enjoy much more than five minutes of it. <laughs> you know that thing in health class where they make someone carry an egg or a sack of flour around for a week to see what it's like having a baby? I think they should just have to watch Eraserhead. And that'll keep them from spawning. Did you have a childhood love of that film, Mike, that now you've grown out of? Or what's your take? I don't. Uh, I certainly didn't see it in childhood. I <laughs> Not childhood. <laughs> that'd be a pretty fucked up childhood if you actually showed your <laughs> 10 year old. <laughs> I saw it at some point in the 90s and it stuck with me to the point that I felt like I didn't really need to rewatch it this time. So I don't remember exactly what was going on in it. I remember moments that I wasn't really eager to rewatch. I think it reveals what Mark watching things at a sped up pace for David Lynch totally defeats the point of David Lynch even being. Yeah, thing. I didn't do that for his films. He is testing your patience all the time with these long shots. And you're either along for the ride or you aren't. Not to judge you, because I watch things sped up all the time, especially if it's something I've seen and I want to remember it. But I just feel like with David Lynch, what's the point? David Lynch seems to be messing with you a lot. Not just testing your patience, but testing like a lot of different things. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is about his practice of transcendental meditation. There have been a lot of articles that have talked about how he practices it also on set and with a lot of his actors. And I think he just wants them to go with him on this journey. You know, I've read a lot about how actors respond to his process. And I watched this little video from W Magazine that featured Naomi Watts and Patricia Arquette and, oh God, I always want to call her Diane now. So it also featured Laura Dern. And Laura Dern was saying that during Wild at Heart, he would sit on the bed during these love scenes with them. And because that's how close the camera was and how close he wanted to be. And he would whisper things in her ear and just tell her in the moment while they were filming the scene, like while she was acting and tell her to go further. And she loved that process. And, and some of the actors are saying like, I think Naomi Watts was like, I don't think a lot of people could handle a director directing them while they are in the middle of a take. Naomi Watts seemed to really like that as well, because she said, for some reason with him, I can handle it. So it is really weird to me how much the actors are drawn to that process. But I, th I mean, I think that it also makes sense for those of us who are drawn to his films. It's not that we like them always. It's not that we're always we're, we're that we're always delighting in and enjoying them in that way. But there is such a strong perspective that he has and an unwillingness to move from his vision that makes you trust whatever that is. Yeah, well, I guess what's your take on his sensuality? To put another like these long sex scenes. I have a really hard time with that. And I, I had to look that up a lot because you had told us, like, pick a film to focus on for yourself. And so I picked Blue Velvet. And that is very hard for me to watch a lot of times. And I do have a lot of issues with the way that he portrays women. 
And not even just the damsel in distress or the sexual violence or the physical violence or the emotional violence, but also the way that he plays the tropes a lot with you have a sweet virginal one and then you have one who's just like a sexy whore. And it's hard. It's hard for me to watch that and think that it's coming from a really pure place for him. But I did a lot of reading about Isabella Rossellini. Have you all read the Roger Ebert review of Blue Velvet from when it first came out? It's famous because he gave it one star. One of David Lynch's most lauded films, Roger Ebert gave one star. And the big reason he gave it one star was the treatment of Isabella Rossellini. So in one of the first scenes we see her in, she has, you could call it a rape scene, you could call it a violent sexual experience with Dennis Hopper. And for me, that is really hard to watch because to me, it just looks like pure assault. And later on in the film, she is naked in front of the home of Kyle MacLachlan's character. And Roger Ebert was particularly angered by those images. He felt that the director was putting her in a position that was not very safe and not really warranted for the character. And so I read a few different things about this that I would like to share with you. Isabella Rossellini has said that because most of her scenes had nudity or violence, there were only an essential member of crew members that were on the set at a time. But then there was also something that came out with a new article. By new, I mean like a year later after, like so like 87 when Roger Ebert wrote. She talks about how when they were filming the scene where she was walking on the street naked, that there were people watching that scene, like locals watching that scene, sitting down on picnic blankets. I don't know why, but she says people came out with blankets and picnic baskets with their grandmothers and small children. I begged the assistant director to warn them that it was going to be a tough scene, that I was going to be totally naked, but they stayed anyway. I went out and talked to them myself, but they were already in a mood of an audience and just stared at me without reacting to my plea and warning. So the fact that they did not clear the set for this, I think is rather terrible. I think this was her first big film that she ever did. And so it makes you wonder how much she was subjected to not really knowing how to advocate for herself appropriately. But now she's going back and saying how much she enjoyed the film and, you know, she still adores David Lynch. So what are you going to do? We have to take her for, you know, at her word. And I think there are so many actresses who have written about working with him and they feel like they trust him and they'll do whatever he wants with a sex scene because they don't feel like they're being exploited. So all I can do really, I guess, is feel like if they feel okay about it and they're the actor and they're saying this is my choice, then it must be okay, no matter how it makes me feel personally to watch. I'm not going to say I found more disturbing, but the thing that struck me as least plausible, like at least I could see those abuse things, you know, as entirely realistic. Like, yes, stuff like that happens, maybe not with a guy with a nitrous thing attached to his... I mean, that's brilliant. (laughs) You know, as over-the-top scene-chewing as Dennis Hopper is in those scenes. But the idea that you could hide in the closet of a sexy lady, and if she finds you, she'll just want to have sex with you. (laughs) Like, no, go to jail. Yeah, it's a great fantasy for a man to have, right? We don't typically know what goes on behind the scenes of a movie, right? We just have to judge it at face value when we're seeing it, and we have the reactions we have. And it's fine for her to say things contemporaneously or even 20 or 30, however, however many years later, but it doesn't change what's on the screen. And I found that also really hard to watch and wild at heart. Similarly with, again, I don't remember all the characters' names, but the way the Willem Dafoe character, when he is, it's that gross sexual assault that somehow Lula at some point gives into. And I just hated in that moment of what was happening there. I wish I hadn't rewatched it. Although on the other hand, if people said, you like that movie Wild at Heart? I would have said, sure, yeah, that's, that's a great one. And now, I don't know. There's a quote in Lost highway where the main character bill pullman's character talks about why he doesn't own a video recorder and it's because he wants to remember things in his own way and i feel that way about having rewatched a lot of this david lynch stuff in fact it's why i didn't end up rewatching mulholland drive and i've seen it a few times when it came out i remember renting it and i had it that was back when you would rent a physical thing and i had it for a couple days and i rewatched it a couple days afterward really liked it and i hope i still do and i think i may never find out for sure I think I'm embargoing that one from a rewatch. Yeah, I somehow found that one less disturbing because the big sexual scenes were between two women, so it felt more consensual. And well, I guess that's not the only reason. Also, that it wasn't like there was an actual rape going on. And I agree with you, that really bothered me in Wild at Heart when he like grabs her and then it looks like she's really enjoying it for a moment. 
And whether or not that's intentional, that is something I see in a lot of his films where there's something like that going on with a woman. And then there's that the chin goes back, the lips partly open, and they really seem to be enjoying the way they're being treated. How do you feel, Mike? I didn't see Wild at Heart, but Blue Velvet, yeah, I, I'm on the same page. It was really weird to watch. It's like, I mean, it was disturbing to watch. I mean, first of all, that movie wasn't even a mystery, right? Like he cracked the mystery in the first third of it and was absolutely right. So everything we were seeing on the screen was kind of there for its own sake. So why put this in, right? Like it doesn't serve any purpose in the movie. It's just there for you to see. It was creepy. Dennis Hopper was (laughs) awful. That movie kind of failed for me in a couple of different ways because it didn't have the sort of fantastic elements that some of his later movies have. And it was disturbing for no kind of reason. I think I'm on the same page as Ebert on this one. I think you was trying to do Hitchcock in that. But now that you point it out, yeah, I was drawing comparisons to Vertigo. But Vertigo does have some kind of mystery, something that is a plot thing that's unraveled, not just a bad character and a good character are set up and eventually there will be a clash between them and that eventually happens. There's suspense how it'll turn out exactly. But in terms of the mystery being unraveled, yeah, you're right. There's not. Even if it is, it's not his doing. So learning that it's a crooked cop and it's his girlfriend's dad's partner. I mean, so what What did he do to make that happen other than stumble into the police station? Just to correct myself, the well-dressed man being Frank. Spoiler! <laughs> like, who cares? That is such a non-surprise surprise. Why is this among his movies so revered? Why is it on the AFI 100 lists? And he was nominated for director, although the movie itself wasn't nominated for best picture. It seems to have some cultural traction more than his other things. And I don't get it. Did it at the time or did it acquire it later? Because some people in the movie, you know, Kyle McLaughlin and Isabella Rossellini got much more well known later. I mean, was it at the time revered? I mean, the fact that he was nominated for an Oscar, I guess, means something, right? That's at the time. And maybe it wasn't. I guess, why is it viewed that way now? And I guess it was on a list of great crime dramas as well. I I don't have all these lists. I know we had links to some of them. I don't want to say it's the Emperor's New Clothes exactly, but I'm not getting this as his masterwork. I actually really enjoyed it for the pacing and for the mood. And I think that that kind of unrestrained villain... You know, I compared it to No Country for Old Men because the fearsomeness of the villain, just complete lack of morals that just makes it why literally like this is no game for a cop playing by the traditional rules to be involved in. Like, you know, really being at the mercy, you know, when he's being driven around, we're going to go for a ride and he's at the mercy of these people like I don't know if that had been on screen so much before maybe there is a Scorsese film before that that I'm not having the chronology clear in mind but that was very effective for me I thought the movie was going in a different direction when I saw that because in that scene where he's in the car going for a ride I don't know if this was deliberate or not but Kyle McLaughlin looked tense but he didn't look out of his element right that's where I thought the movie was going that he was going to find some kinship or some similarities with Frank but it never went there it just turned into a, a weird mystery that was already solved I finished that movie thinking it probably could have been better being something slightly different. I was also really drawn to the imagery of it, too. We actually have a really beautiful poster of it in our bedroom, which I I know sounds really creepy. (laughs) It is actually one of my husband's favorite films. And going back and watching it, when I was reminded how grotesque it was at times, I was kind of looking at him like, how is this How is this your favorite film? I'm so confused and disturbed right now. That and Star Trek Next Generation, exactly the same sensibility. (laughs) It's really strange, but It's an accessible film as far as David Lynch goes, but it also isn't a great mystery. And I think for me, he's at his best when we still have a great mystery. Now let's take a quick sponsor break. Five months into working from home, it's more important than ever to listen to what you want to listen to, not what your family slash new office mates are listening to. Now is the time to get a great pair of wireless earbuds. But before you go off and spend hundreds of dollars on a pair, you have got to check out the wireless earbuds from Raycon. Raycon earbuds are quality, and they start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds out there. Their newest model is the Everyday E25 earbuds, and they are the best yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, stronger base, and a sleek, compact design that gives you a super effective noise-isolating fit. I can't emphasize enough how comfortable these earbuds are. The sound quality is perfect for listening to music or podcasts. Mine are a gorgeous rose gold, but you can get them in a variety of colors, and they stay subtly nested in your ears without any dangling wires or knobs. 
Raycon was founded by Ray J, and celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge, and Brandy are obsessed with Raycons. Now is the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com and use the code PRETTY15 for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash pretty and use the code PRETTY15. Now back to the discussion. When he won the Honorary Academy Award just last year, it was awarded to him The presenters were Isabella Rossellini, Laura Dern, and Kyle MacLachlan. And I I don't have access to his the whole speech they gave, though I suppose it's there somewhere. But the snippet I have, the reason he was awarded this was, quote, for fearlessly breaking boundaries in pursuit of his singular cinematic vision. And I see the second part of that, the singular cinematic vision. I struggle a little bit on the breaking boundaries part. And again, I feel like maybe not so much in the 80s when this was made, but a lot of we had kind of gone to these dark places with some other directors before. What do you think about that? Certainly what Mike was saying just about Twin Peaks in particular. Yeah, boundary breaking, sure. As far as the gangster stuff, I'm not so sure. As far as popular surrealism, yeah. Wouldn't you think Eraserhead? I mean, I don't know like how many lesser known. It seems like whenever you see something from the 70s by an artsy director, even that first George Lucas thing, that sci-fi, what's it called? THX 1138. Yeah, and that's boring. Maybe it's Kubrick's fault, like where this pacing thing came from. So it's not really groundbreaking. It's just a variation on a theme, because certainly there had been plenty of surrealist filmmakers, you know, in the 60s that he's just combining things in a way that have not been combined before. And a few things got more popular. People are always called groundbreaking because they did something that a lot of other people had done, but they made it popular. I'll buy that, Mark. And it might be the case that nobody remembered those boundaries had been broken before and those boundaries were restored by, uh, you know, 1983, right? Gremlins restored them. I mean, even like television sitcoms in the 60s were crazier than in the 80s. So, I mean, the boundary might have been a a second boundary. So I do want to bring up as dual themes, the pacing and the camp. I was surprised that there wasn't more camp earlier on than like in The Elephant Man, which was the only film I think besides Inland Empire that I'd never watched. I was so impressed by that film. I so see why it won so many awards. It's barely a David Lynch film. I mean, it's just he he did get in late in the game and did help co-write the script, but it was an existing story. And the reason that it's so sentimental is anyway, but like those are real actors doing normal things. Whereas I thought based on Twin Peaks and Wild at Heart that he had a special way of directing people where they always sounded insane. But no, that was kind of channeled just to those couple of projects. I really didn't see that so much later. That's kind of one of the things I don't like about, at least for more than a few minutes in Twin Peaks, why I don't want to watch that series again. Originally, I found it very off-putting. Yes. Mike, you're a Twin Peaks fan. Is the humor, the absurdism, is part of what you love about it? I don't know why I don't hate it. There was some other filmmaker from the 90s that also had people acting really unnaturally. And I couldn't even watch it. I can't remember who it is. John Waters is sort of best known as this camp guy in a similar way. Wait, Hal Hartley? Is that who it is? What film? I see. I can't even, I I don't even remember what it was I saw because I had to stop watching it. But anyway, just to get back to David Lynch, I don't know why I don't mind people not acting like human beings in his movies. I think part of it is he selected actors that could carry it off in a way that didn't make you want to turn the TV off. Like Kyle MacLachlan, when he's acting weird, it's still fun to watch, right? <laughs> you know, with somebody else, it might not have worked. So I don't know if it was deliberate or luck or if he knew this was going to be the outcome. Yeah, for some reason, acting like non-human cartoon characters being portrayed by physical actors seems to work okay as far as I'm concerned. It also highlights that they are saying lines rather than talking. And that dialogue sometimes has a sharpness to it or a cleverness to it that you can kind of lean into and enjoy. And not to really draw a comparison to in style at all to Aaron Sorkin, but his characters also say things that people don't say. And you don't really feel like you're hearing a real conversation, but you can appreciate what's happening and kind of get into what's being presented to you. I mean, I get that part of it. And I think that comes across more in Twin Peaks than it does maybe in his movies. I feel, again, having just rewatched Wild at Heart, some of the things that are said are absurd, but at least I I can appreciate them a little bit in how it's all being constructed and presented. During The Elephant Man, Mel Brooks, who was one of the producers on that, referred to David Lynch as James Stewart from Venus. It took me a second, and then I started thinking of the cadence of the way those two people spoke. And I thought, wow, yeah, he does seem like he's from this other time period. 
of this 1950s, 60s era of America, but it's off. It's not really in our world. And so it makes sense that all of the characters that he writes tend to be just a little off and askew. They are like James Stewart, but James Stewart in Mars. I do wonder, and I wonder what you guys think, does he consider himself to be a great screenwriter, scriptwriter? Do you think he is? Do you think that the quote unquote bad writing and some of the stuff I can't believe that people have to say out loud is all intentional? Or do you, do you think that that's just the way his brain works and he thinks it's good? Or is it supposed to be weird and disturbing and he's doing that on purpose? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, maybe. <laughs> It's confusing, right? In no particular order. <laughs> I think he realized he can't write a conventional movie. Like watching Blue Velvet, the weakest points in the movie, this was one of the first things I rewatched. And when I watched it, one of the weakest points in the movie were the things that were there to advance the plot forward. Like the cops could have been anybody, right? They were barely in the movie. They were there just to get you to the ending. And when I was watching that, I literally thought... Why doesn't he just dispense with that stuff? And boy, did he. Like, by the time Mulholland Drive comes around, nothing connects to anything. It's like he got rid of the stuff he knew he was weak at, doubled down on the idiosyncratic things, and then just left it to the viewer to figure out what he meant. I think at some level, he understands that he can't write a plot or normal human dialogue, but he accepts <laughs> that as his own style. And those are two really different things, though, aren't they, Mike? I feel like if you write dialogue strange, we can at least follow it if we know what he's trying to do. I guess the monkey movie notwithstanding. But if you write a plot in a way that is hard to follow, you can really just end up being lost or going down your own rabbit hole of trying to tell yourself what the story meant. I mean, I'm still going back and forth in my own head on what actually I, I saw when I watched Lost Highway. Do you have a, a strong picture in your mind of what that movie even is? Not, um, no. There's just no way to qualify that. In some of his movies, Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway, it seems like he didn't leave enough information in the movie for the viewer to figure it out. Like, it might have made sense the way he designed it in his head, but then he removed so many of the connecting bits that it just seems like nothing causes anything else. Like, you can kind of understand the character's motivations in the moment, but then there's a non sequitur coming constantly. And even if you understand the character, it turns into a different character. So, like, how much of the previous character does this new one in inherit? I got confused thinking about this. Can I figure out Lost Highway? No, except that at the end, the pseudo Bill Pullman is driving off in a car. He was originally arrested for auto theft. That was my big thing. <laughs> like, it does connect to the beginning somehow. There's no way I could reconcile every aspect of that movie with what happens in the other parts of the movie. There is a, a subreddit called, I don't know the exact name of it, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. And that movie was in there and someone pointed out that the way you explain that to someone like they're a five-year-old is, this is not appropriate for a five-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think, Mark? That was your kind of deep dive. Lost Highway, right? Yeah, I mean, it was almost like a Twilight Zone episode with a few scenes left out. But then there are just things that are emphasized that, you know, he becomes this different person, just like in the actual Twilight Zone episode where this guy somehow gains the ability to transform between different faces. And so he's in jail and they let him out because he's clearly a different person. <laughs> But this other person has a past and nobody will talk about it. Like they saw him a few days ago somehow change and they show a few brief flashes of something. So if you want to fit this into a Twilight Zone alien interference kind of thing, you can push it that way. But then there are things that are introduced. I guess it's the same thing like in Mulholland Drive with the time jump. Let's take one at a time, though, in Lost Highway that under this new persona runs into the identical twin sister friend of the woman, you know, also played by Patricia Arquette, that the first character was in jail for murdering. And it's like a big discovery that this younger character is finally in a house that the older character was in before and things resonate with him and he sees a photo that has both the women together and is asking, wait, are these both you? And his mysterious alter ego or something is saying like, that's not her name, she's lying. As if to wedge it into something that makes sense. But no, it's not explained. It doesn't make sense. The time periods are mixed up. So yeah, there's a few pieces missing to that one, but I really enjoyed it, perhaps for that reason. There's an article I read last night after I finished watching it that attempts to explain it, and it explains it in that everything leading up to the prison scene, those are things that are happening in real time, and everything that happens after that is in Bill Pullman's head, and those are different versions of him. Like, the three main men are different versions of himself, his id, his ego, and his superego. 
it was an interesting article. Don't know if it's true. I also saw that Patricia Arquette asked him, he seems to be famous for this because I know it happened in Twin Peaks a lot for like creating a script and not really explaining it to his actors. And she said, am I playing two different people here? Are these the same person or two different people? And he was like, well, what do you think, Patricia? Well, an Inland Empire is even worse regarding this that I didn't realize until after I was reading about it that apparently Laura Dern is playing three characters, not two characters. That the central premise, did it? How many of you guys actually sat through that one? This is the only one I did not see. I left it to you, Mark. I'm the only one that saw this one. I'll just tell you the central premise, which sounds way more fascinating than the movie is, is that Laura Dern has been cast in a film with Justin Thoreau, and it's a romance film about having an illicit affair and it being found out and maybe something bad is going to happen. And it's sort of implied that these characters might have a similar affair to the characters that they're playing. And the Laura Dern character gets confused. The best scene in it is where she's talking to him and she's like, suddenly, this totally sounds like the dialogue from the movie we're in. And the director yells, hey, what the hell? Because she's confused as to whether she's in the movie or not. And so that is a great psychological thing to launch from. But there's so much other weird stuff in there of people speaking Polish. And this is where that rabbit sitcom that we referred to in our wacky sitcoms episode. This is actually a side part of this, an insert where occasionally characters are watching this surrealist human sized rabbits saying very dour things with a laugh track going. And then there's a whole thing with a prostitute that I didn't understand was supposed to be a separate character. And I didn't understand because it's also Laura Dern, how this was supposed to relate to these other characters. Cause she herself expresses like, I don't know what comes before what thing it's clearly presenting just like in Mulholland drive that, you know, this person has had some sort of breakdown and doesn't understand the flow of time anymore. All this points back to the movie I championed for this podcast, which is Dune. Well, first of all, I'm just going to mention something about this, which it also got a one star from Roger Ebert. I guess that's a theme. I'll just, the one sentence I'll read from his review is, quote, this movie is a real mess, an incomprehensible, ugly, unstructured, pointless excursion into the murkier realms of one of the most confusing screenplays of all time, which I won't argue with. any of that, I suppose. And it is confusing. And this is a movie of his where attempts were made to fix that. The movie was released on television and it was made quite a bit longer. A new introduction was added that had more padding and tried to give it connective tissue so people would understand who the different people were and who the different factions were. And they added some other things. And by all accounts, the movie is no better. It's just longer and not any more understandable. And David Lynch took his name off of it. So it's credited to Alan Smithy now. So I guess the lesson is don't try to fix this because it doesn't indicate anything is broken. It's just what it is. It seemed broken, though. The one scene that I remember most vividly is when I guess some princess is explaining something, just doing the exposition. Then she fades out and then she fades back and it says, oh, yeah. And one more thing. It's like they knew it wasn't going to work. I forgot. to. It's pretty much exactly (laughs) unless it's just a fake memory in my brain. But this that's how I remember it is that the exposition was complete. And then they had to come back and tell you one more thing, because maybe maybe this will help a little bit more. Oh, it is a profoundly flawed movie. The amount of voiceover thinking that goes on with so many characters is just batshit crazy. Like that is not how to make a movie. Like, I don't know what the right way is, but that is not the right way. So yeah, I'm not really strongly defending this movie. I'm just defending my love of it. It looked really cool. How can this be? <laughs> that is the best part. The little child it's with a... the queen yes. Yes. <laughs> A very young Alicia Witt. That's right. Who went on to have quite a career, that one. I guess we haven't mentioned the straight story, which is the only one I did not rewatch in full, but I did kind of, it's for free on YouTube. So I just like jumped forward a lot <laughs> to remind myself because I had remembered seeing the movie. I didn't remember it being a David Lynch movie. And that is one that it seems to be completely free of the camp. It's completely free of the surrealism. It is boring. Every single scene is like watching somebody in real time doing something, but it's a different kind of artsy than his normal things. Like it's a traditional story and I watched the end of it, which I won't give away, but like it is actually beautifully minimalist. Like these two characters connecting, almost no dialogue, just great as far as that goes. But what does this mean 
you know, you kind of wonder why he didn't do a bunch of other films like this, or I don't know if that was just a one-off experiment and people didn't like it because it wasn't lynchy enough or what? He said that it was one of his most experimental films. And you can see that because it just is such a departure from everything else he'd done. I mean, it's not a mystery at all. It's really not weird. And you're right. It is kind of hard to watch because it is slow in his way, but without the mystery. And that's, I think, hard to just sit through. Richard Farnsworth was nominated for an Oscar and I believe a Golden Globe as well for this role. And he passed away about a year later after filming this because he had terrible bone cancer while he was filming this. So he was in a lot of pain and a lot of that that you're seeing in the film, him with the two canes, having a hard time getting up and down. He was the age of the actual Alvin Strait in real life and was going through some major suffering. So I agree with you, Mark. It was rather slow, but I think the score was gorgeous. The Angelo Badalamenti score was gorgeous, as so often his scores are. But this one was just a little bit different. It was more folksy. Definitely not my favorite, but I appreciated it. And I appreciated, I think, what he was trying to do with just letting us just like live in that moment and enjoy the scenery. You don't think someone just bet him that he couldn't make a G-rated movie? That's what it was. I basically spent my last two weeks reading IMDb for all of these. And Richard Farnsworth turned him down for this role. As long as you believe all the trivia that's on IMDb. So maybe all these facts that I'm giving you are wrong. But Richard Farnsworth, I heard, turned him down because he had seen Blue Velvet and he didn't like the kind of language that was used. So actually, Lynch did not write this script. Okay, so that explains a lot of it. (laughs) For whatever it's worth, Erica, I don't rent media, physical media anymore. But when I used to, and I would watch director tracks or commentary, I would find that a lot of the trivia was just people who had watched the commentary and wrote up trivia. Not that that's where it always comes from, but a lot of it is can be trusted because that's the source. I was just reminded of films like Yuli's Gold is another one I looked up, which was just these really slow films. Like that's just what I associated for a long time with artsy. The <laughs> English Patient. Peter Fonda, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. At least stuff blows up in The English Patient. Yuli's Gold is about beekeeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. On Golden Pond. I don't remember that one enough to say whether that was super slow. The ethic of slowness that somebody into transcendental meditation I could see would be encouraging in film watchers, whether it's watch me pan over this landscape in a slow manner while music that I like plays. Tarantino and Scorsese that we've covered on here both are guilty of that. And perhaps it's not a bad thing to push on audiences to like be more patient with your life. Something like that. Be more patient with the director. In Seinfeld, there's a 192 minute fictitious film called The Pain and the Yearning. The plot is described as an old woman experiences pain and yearning. So (laughs) there's always that one. Ah, All right. Well, any sort of final themes that we haven't brought up? We could have a whole separate episode and probably will at some point on body horror because we didn't really get into that here so much. of It turns out what I thought was one of my favorite David Lynch films was the David Cronenberg film. I really want to talk about him instead or next or at some point. Let's do it. Which one was that? Map to the Stars or Map of the Stars? I forget what the exact title was. I was also, one of the articles I'll link to for folks, just describing his influence, which is not like all these other filmmakers doing surrealism. It's like, there are a lot of TV shows that are sort of like our long-form mysteries like Twin Peaks. So, big deal. <laughs> you know, that, that seemed like that serial TV has made that as a innovation redundant. I don't actually buy that though. I read that article in the Atlantic where they were talking about the influence on Tarantino and all that. It's like, oh, they both had a severed ear and things like that. I don't know. I mean, it seemed like every single example you put in there seemed like a stretch. The Room in The Shining, it has a similar number to The Room in Eraserhead. So it must be. Yeah, that's right. It's actually a different number, right? 28 and 237 or something like that. They're, they're distinct numbers. The curtains were perfectly vertical, hanging in a top to down fashion. If I may, Mark. He could have made the numbers the same, right? If you wanted to show the influence, you would just make the same number. Anyway. I have a thought to throw out there. This is also from Rosalini. And this is in regards to Blue Velvet, but I think that it, it made a lot of sense for me for all of his work. She said, everybody has a brain that flashes images that are strange. We don't pay attention to those. We are trained to have an intelligence that is rational, that follows certain paths. But David pays much more attention to that, the images of emotion. 
Well, listeners should let us know what other filmmakers they want us to do this to, <laughs> to subject ourselves to. <laughs> it, 17 hours. This is hard. Whatever. This is hard. <laughs> it was rough. I'm not like a voracious consumer of media either. So sitting through the entire third season of Twin Peaks and watching three movies, not short movies. Oh, man. This did something to my brain. I'm going to like have to rinse tomorrow. Why don't you rinse out with some Inland Empire? (laughs) I haven't seen that one. That's just the parts in Polish (laughs) with no subtitles and no explanation for why they're there. I actually watched a bit of it on YouTube, but the resolution was so bad I couldn't stand it anymore. And I was wondering, is this missing subtitles? I guess it's not. You're just supposed to like handle the Polish. It's just weird. And was the resolution that bad on purpose or (laughs) is that the way it was filmed? It looked like Legoland. Yeah, I, you're right. Actually, I did think about that. Is this supposed to be like Legoland in Jerky? But um, I'm guessing no, but I still don't know. It is the first that he filmed in digital. It came out in 2006. So it's not like people's iPhones, but it's kind of one of those films like, you know, you keep hearing, now, especially now during the pandemic, that all these filmmakers are making these. I can make an art house quality film, just people's phones. And like some of it sort of looks like that. Hmm. I can't wait. <laughs> all right. So long, listeners. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Yeah, thanks. It was fun. Thanks so much, Mike. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.